In studio with Mill and Gill, Matt Miller back to having top billing because he is a Hall of Fame after all. Matty, good morning to you. Good morning. New York Times best-selling author, but I still believe it would be more amusing to interview the New York Times worst-selling author instead. <laughs> <laughs> He's not one of those, though. John Gilstrap, how are you? Good morning. Do they keep that list? <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just to chase them out of the business, cut their losses, stop them from wasting their time. You sold exactly zero books again for the sixth straight month. Do dear, something else. Dear author, hang it up. <laughs> <laughs> and I use that term loosely, author. Uh, in studio, we've got the matching mics. Uh, they're both uh, members of the House of Delegates. Uh, Mr. Hornby, who's the mogul, owns this place and everything that's in it. Good morning. So the last uh, few few weeks I've, I've been coming on, I've been uh, bringing other delegates from yes. all, all over the state on. So I placed like 98 phone calls yesterday, <laughs> um, but we got hyped today. So, you know, I live with him. You can, you, we're good friends. So he, he was my last call, but he, but he answered. <laughs> the only one who has nothing else to do. <laughs> and this messes up my whole week. I'm yeah. used to come in on Fridays, uh, yeah. and and now I'm going to have to take tomorrow off because it's just the way my work my week works. And the next day, cause, yeah. Know, so so it's, Doc, it's Doc Joe Ellington answered. He was going to come on this. Morning. He goes, I, I got a C-section at about 9.05, but I think I could swing it in. But I was like, no, why don't you do the C-section? I'll call a hype. So, yeah. so Joe will be on uh, with us. He's the chair of education in the next few weeks. It <laughs> would be interesting, though, if uh, we could give the, the doc one of our sports headset mics and let him do the interview while he's performing the C-section. I do not want to get sued yeah. for somebody's yeah. bad C-section because yeah, Joe's do doing that. an interview. They do that in sports nowadays, sure. right? You know, one of the best uh, clips that I've seen, I don't know if it had to have been a preseason game, but uh, the shortstop for the Dodgers, uh, uh, where he, the, he's on mic talking to the booth, and there's a ball hit up the middle, and he he says literally, you know, "Excuse me, guys, I got to make a play." And yeah. he shifts to his left, scoops it up, and makes the throw on the first. And of course, the broadcast team is just dying laughing that you know that he's apologizing for interrupting the interview to actually play the sport he's supposed to be playing. Given the fact of the S FCC, I think putting a live mic on a baseball player is just a, a dangerous thing to do. I a live mic on kids, <laughs> anything or at a game. I, I well, can't believe they do that. The NFL games, you see the parabolic microphones oh, right. all over the place, mm -hmm. and every once in a while, you hear something that you oh, probably yeah. shouldn't hurt. I think the other yeah. Matt did a uh, interview after a Capitals game. Didn't, yes. Wasn't he down there? Yes. We, yes. Had, we had a little. He did. Yes. He interviewed one of his friends, and uh, yeah, we had an issue with that. Yeah. So, they, yeah anytime you're talking allowed. about the puck, the the, yeah. the, the, the puck yeah. is what he was talking <laughs> about. Uh, stop the the goaltender stopping the the puck, puck, uh, puck, puck. was the. Thankfully, it was a cell phone and uh, not extremely clear. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we all forgotten about it until you brought it back up. Well, I haven't because I'm still waiting for the letter from the well, FCC. <laughs> I, know, I know Crawford told me that he hung up the cell phone and he looked at his buddy. He's like, I think you just got me fired. You know, it's just like I'm done. Well, but that's the thing about the FCC regulations is in, unless somebody complains, it's not an issue. So, oh, wow. and it's about the community standards, too. So if you live in a community, they're throwing their word around a lot. They might not complain as much, I guess. Well, that is, word does get thrown around a lot, though. I know you recognize it as a coach. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm surprised the language and how it has changed in our society because, you know, at, at Shepherd Ram football games, where we're located on the, the now visitor side, the old home mm -hmm. press box, and we're on the top, I have never heard the, the F and B words as much as I've heard this season from coaches and players because you're so close to everything on the sideline. It's just been incredible. High school stands, same way. Yeah. With parents. Uh, I, I was shocked. I was, uh, my son was playing on, in a band, so we were actually in the stands, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. not in the press box or you know, up, up top. And the amount of uh, foul language coming from the yeah. stands was, was so shocking. For the FCC rules, is there a buy for the – you spill the cup of coffee on your lap or whatever, and it's just sort of that – instantaneous thing do you, do you, do you get a one-off you, you get a buy uh if it is somebody else but if rob were to say like go on a rant so we bring up hillary clinton and he goes <laughs> on a rant <laughs> um, and, and and says that it's an instant fine i mean okay. that that the professional in the building is, it is the for one. each word or once you start is you just keep going and it doesn't matter. no i think it's you know one or six it doesn't matter okay. I mean, it, it's kind of and they probably take uh, into consideration the the magnitude of the moment. I mean, mm -hmm. with 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 uh, <coughs> story, you know, the 
the Caps had just won the Stanley they, Cup. They so, I mean, it was a pretty emotional, exciting time. And, and from the stands of somebody here, if you hear that. That's Hillary Clinton barking. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> I saved that sound bite. Just in case someone would mention her name, I saved it. But listen, listen, here you go. That's that's Hillary. I don't even remember in the election leading up to the Trump, uh, the Trump uh, Hillary Clinton election, she got caught on the microphone barking about something. I don't even remember the context of it. And you saved that. Why? Wow. Why would you not? Yeah. Why would you <laughs> not? Know. That's great. Never know when you can pull that up. Like right now. Right now. Yes. Just bring that's out beautiful Hillary. I don't know why she was barking. I don't remember the context of it. I just remember remembering that it was very unusual, and I would have to capture that audio clip. Was it a full moon? At the time? I don't, don't know. know. <laughs> I don't know the context of it. Uh, this is the election day for uh, a few states around uh, the country. And earlier today, Clayton Neville reviewed some of the uh, items that people are thinking about around the country. I don't know if you watched uh, any Sunday football games, uh, you saw negative advertising. In the DC <laughs> advertising. Everything was about abortion in Virginia. Yeah. It's yeah. the only yeah. thing that people were campaigning on is whether you want to restrict abortion rights or relax abortion rights. And no, nothing else was brought up well, about whatever I think you believe from, in. Yeah, or, or from the other side, it was gun rights, Biden. You know, it, it, it was truly negative. And they were back to back to back to back. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was the fast. They grouped them in the same commercial cluster, which was fascinating because you got to hear why Mike Hornby is the worst human being ever said by Mike Kite. And then the next commercial was why Mike Kite is the worst human being ever said by Mike Hornby. It, yeah, it was. Yeah, but I'll agree with Rob. Ninety percent of it was about abortion or women's rights, or had something to do with that that context. Mm -hmm. um, a coupled with uh, MAGA extremists, and yeah. you know, uh, that was the whole the whole ad was about that. And and I think on the other side, it was the um, this person is uh, in in favor of defund police and spoke out yeah. on this. And so, that was rare. That was yeah. one of those. Yep. Um, but it, you're right. Ninety percent is about abortion and women's rights. And it's going to be interesting to see how Virginia goes, because I think Virginia is kind of a bellwether of, of most of the United They're States. They're totally purple. They've got a, a Republican governor, then they've got, I believe it's a Republican Senate, barely. And, a de and I didn't and recognize right. any Democratic of Democratic Senate, Republican House, but the, the, either way. But the margins are very slim. And if, if they take over at both the House and the Senate, and it's got a little bit of uh, maybe a, a bit of a majority for the Republicans, they're now starting to think Yunkin might be a candidate for president. Right. And I think all their seats are up. Like Everything. e everything's up. Every so it'll be up. it'll be really interesting to see how Yunkin has changed that race or changed that state to see you know, Well, and Ken Kentucky has an interesting race in their their gubernatorial race as well that mm -hmm. you have a Democrat right now and then you have a Republican, I believe, lieutenant um, governor who's who's running against him. So it'd be interesting to see how that one and and I believe the Republican was down by 15 points and is now up by a point. So um, whatever he's doing, he, he seems to be doing right there. So I don't know what the issues are there or how he's made that move, but. That's another interesting race to watch. And I think this could be a, a telltale sign of, of what to expect in 2024 as well. Was a big drumbeat? I didn't see these ads. <clears throat> was a big drumbeat on the educational issues that actually got Youngkin into office? Are they still alive? No. Uh, I, I think from the right, they're, they're pushing that, you know, school choice, things like that. Sure. But the, the negative ads from the left were mostly about abortion. I Correct. Mean, that, that was, it was MAGA Republicans want to strip women of all their rights. That's the, the message they were sending. Well, I think there's a larger message in with that's buried within that. There was such a pushback when Roe was overturned, and I, I forget the name of that case. But the whole purpose, the, I thought the evil part of Roe v. Wade was that it took this determination away from the states. Mm -hmm. Now it's coming back to the states, and we actually get to see for the first time in 40 or 50 years, however long it's been, where the, the general public stands on the issue of abortion. And it's it's kind of a cleansing thing. However, I I have my opinions on where it should go. Not I don't have a vote in Virginia anymore, um, but at least we'll know. And I think that's that's good. And I think on the ballot in a couple of states is this the issue of abortion, where mm -hmm. it's actually as a, gone, re as as a referendum, a as a wow. referendum, where, where, where it's in Ohio, I believe. I think is, it is. It, it, it's uh, a big yeah, issue. Uh, yeah, I think it's on the ballot. Um, it'll be interesting. It'll be really interesting. The issue to me, though. In what you just said, 
Gil. Um, his, uh, <laughs> Let's not let that do, get do legs, re- okay? Do I have to refer <laughs> to you as that now? Um, it is the, the idea, while it now goes back to the states, and we're going to see what you know the people within the states say about it, we've also had 40 or 50 years of indoctrination to the people that are now going to be placing those votes that, no, this is a constitutional right, when it never was a constitutional right. It was written into by those justices in 72, 3, whatever that was. I was a little guy. I don't remember that much. But um, it, it was kind of written in. But but you ask most people today, is it a constitutional right? Oh, yes, it is. Because the indoctrination, you know, you tell the lie long enough, it becomes the truth. So that you know, the, the voting within states today is going to be based on that mindset as opposed to what that mindset would have been, say, 50 years ago. Well, I think also some of the national politicians made it a uh, – the guy from South Carolina, they, they want to make it a federal issue. They want, oh, we should have abortion as a – we just won – <laughs> this right. Back to the states. Why do you want to make it a federal issue again? This is this is a win for all the states because now the people can decide. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing better than five guys sitting around talking about women's abortion right. rights <laughs> <laughs> or indoctrination. Let's talk about some of these uh, colleges in, in in America right now. Let's talk. Well, I know you wanted to, you had brought that up earlier, but go yeah. ahead. Have your uh, have you know I, it's as an immigrant to this this country and as a when I took the pledge um, to become a citizen. I renounced all my previous pledges to whatever country I came from. And I just find it really irritating or or, it irks me that there are so many protests with people talking about colonization and this and that. And they're talking about, they're talking about America. Mm -hmm. None of us, unless you're an indigenous, uh, you know, person, none of us were, were from the country we that we live in. And you can look across the world mm-hmm. like that. Um, but now we're going to talk about ripping apart America because colonizers and oh, oh, get, need to get riz- rid of Israel. It's infuriating to me. It, and I don't know what these higher education people are thinking, uh, you know, where these kids are coming from. And these are immigrants that have come here and are taking advantage of the freedom, the, the 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 right to free speech in this country. Every you know, these people would not be able to protest in the countries that mm-hmm. they came from, and it 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 it's just disheartening. So that's my rant. That was you kind of had trouble getting the words out on that. It, one. It, yeah. I I have to choose my words because what I really want to say <laughs> <laughs> it is probably not meant for the public because I I truly feel. Uh, and I know I'm not as conservative as, as my friend Mike here, but we've had lots of conversations over many years, and I appreciate every second of being in this country and all the rights that it gives me. And I don't think these young folks these days, and young folks, old folks, I don't think they appreciate what America really stands for. Yeah, I've said many times, I have, I have drugged Mr. Hornby kicking and screaming to the right to where he is today. <laughs> um, but we've had some very good conversations left and right and why things are the way they are and, and you know, maybe some history lessons and stuff. And, and it sort of explains why we are as Americans where we are today. And, um, I, you know, as as an immigrant and somebody who has seen the other side, I think he can really appreciate um, where we are in America and what we have here in America. And I think um, a lot of uh, – people here that were born here in the United States take it for granted um, and they haven't seen the rest of the world and I think it's very eye-opening if you travel um, around the world um, especially to places I'm not talking about Europe but I'm talking about places where there there is that third world country still um, in in droves in, yeah, like, we, like we, Africa yeah we were sitting in, in Africa and in, in, you know in South Africa which is a developing country and Mike and I sitting there having a glass of wine and he looked at me and he said, how did you ever live like this? You live in cages. Yes. Uh, and, and it was one of those things where I looked at him. I was like, what do you? Well, it's just walls. And then I was like, well, there are barbed wire on top of the walls and glass on top of the walls and armed guards outside. And, and I came back home. I drive through my neighborhood. And the first thing that, that somebody from Africa says to me is, where are all the walls? Like, it's so, it's so free and open. How do you keep people out? 
<laughs> Mike yeah. was like, we don't look at the southern border. We don't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and sitting over at Mike's house a couple of times, you know, there there were. It was funny because there were kids that were walking across his yard to go to the the school basketball court and stuff like that, and 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 Mike's dad was was yelling, "What are they doing walking across your yard?" And I was like, "Holy crap, Stu, ease up! They're just kids going to play." Yeah, but they're walking across your lawn. And I was like, "So what? I mean, we're not in Africa anymore. It's it's okay. Not it's, not everybody that comes into your yard is looking to rob you right. or kill you, <laughs> which." in reality, is a big problem in other developing countries. You know, I went to high school and college in the 70s, and hating America has always been what the cool kids do. On a liberal arts campus, certainly going back to the Vietnam years, flag burning, wearing the flag as part of the seat of your pants and all that kind of stuff, that's been going on for an entire generation, maybe a generation and a half, and maybe even before that. That's not what I find concerning. What I find concerning is the the reshaping of the, the, the political basis of this country. In this very studio a few weeks ago, I, I brought up a, a quotation from Thomas Jefferson, and somebody in the studio said, well, we don't le need to listen to him because he owns slaves. And first of all, there's a huge logical fallacy in, in the statement. What I find terrifying is the stifling of opposing thought. When we have college campuses, that, which is supposed to be where you get uncomfortable, you're supposed to hear the opposing point of view, so be exposed to something that is, is not your, your childhood experience. But we are now in a position where comedians can't do their thing because the, the folks get offended. College campuses, the administrations of colleges are taking sides politically and stifling the, the other point of view. And that's what's terrifying. That's, that's when we've really started to speed up the spiral. Because once you start shutting down free speech and free expression, including burning the flags, it's not, it, it's a, if you, we're in America and you get to do that. But once we start choosing which flags can be burned and which ones can't, um, we're we're in a in a really difficult spot. And now that we have this thing going on in Gaza be, uh, with Israel and Palestine, the choosing of sides um, that is supported by kids are going to be kids, right? But when you have the the people who are in charge of the kids taking the side that is fundamentally against America and America's allies, it is terrifying. Well, I think this the, the the whole Marxist ideology has been around for a, a long, long time, and it has sort of festered in in um, you know, higher education areas. Um, but I think for a long time, um, you know, there was there were enough capitalists and, and conservatives out there to to uh, give the other side and say that you know these these ideologies have been tried before in other areas, and I can can cite examples, and they have failed always, and this is why they have failed because human beings are human beings, and that's why Marxist ideology doesn't work. Um, but in these these uh, places of higher learning, they are allowed to fester, and, and it's like you said, you don't hear the other side. You, today, you don't have the the conservative viewpoint coming in and debating these facts back and forth. So what what kids are getting nowadays in higher education is just one side, all the time one side, unless you go to a, a university like, like Liberty, where you hear the majority of the conservative side. Um, but you have to be able to... These institutions of higher learning have to be able to have debate. And to have debate, you have to have both sides. And that is not going on in, in the institutions of higher learning right now. We're only hearing one side all the time, and that's why you see these protests. But isn't that coming directly from the professors? I mean, it... it well, it we, is, we, but it used to be you'd, you'd have administrations that would would say would tamper it down and say, okay, you know, you can teach that, but we're going to allow the other side to come in. We're going to you have to teach both sides of it. You know, I I took a, a class not so long ago, um, just for the heck of it. I took a history class at, at Shepherd um, Campus here in Martinsburg, and um, I was very surprised. It was a history class, and we went through all the history. I, I could not tell which side of the fence the professor was while he was teaching 
history, and I was very pleasantly surprised by that because I didn't want his ideology. And, you know, I come from a conservative background, and I trust me, I was looking for it, um, and it never reared its head. And he was he was very good about not imposing his um, his ideology or his viewpoints on history. This is the history. This is what it is. This is what I'm teaching. So um, it, it can happen out there. And, and I think history, and I know this is hard to say, I think history is written in the eyes of the victor. Oh, always. It, it, yeah. Always, <laughs> correct. I mean, the winner it, writes the history book. Yeah, I mean, that, that, <laughs> because the loser kind of, has been killed. <laughs> well, and, and you can go back in time. Uh, and, you know, I didn't learn a lot of American history growing up because obviously I didn't learn in America. So we learned a lot of world history from way, way back. And America is so new and young that I think we teach American history. We don't go back before um, that much. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you'll you understand the world a lot better if you understand the whole history. Of well, that's a world history class. Yeah. And, and it's, it depends on where, which I had when I was, we don't teach world <laughs> history in school. I, I, Western I, I don't think is what so. we call it. But it also mm -hmm. depends on where you're getting the world history from and who's teaching yep. it. Because I can tell you right now, if you are taught about the Revolutionary War here in the United States, and then you go over to the UK and, and talk about the war against the, the colonies, um, it, I'll bet you it's a very different history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys were the bad folks, right? I mean, when they're teaching it. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, exactly. exactly. <clears throat> when I was in college, I was a Civil War history major at William & Mary, and the guy who ran the department was Ludwell H. Johnson. And Dr. Johnson was, um, he was old in, in the 70s, so... He grew up, his mom was a nurse in the old Confederate soldiers' home in Richmond. And little Lud, when he was, was a little boy, would hang out with these old soldiers and hear their stories. And then he would pass on their stories. There wasn't a political element to this. This is life as a soldier and life, you know, as, as a Southerner at the time. And so when he would pass history along, it had a definite point of view. Because it was it was history as filtered through the points of view of of the the men that he would that he would talk to as a kid. Now the test had absolutely nothing to do with his lectures. The test had everything to do with the books. But the lectures, hearing these stories that are just one, he, he lined us up one time and he and he said, "Just shake my hand." We went through and he said, "Okay, you have shaken the hand of a man who shook the hand of a man who shook Abraham Lincoln's hand." You know, and that's kind of the magic of, of, of history. Yeah. So I, I think there does need, I don't think there's a problem when a professor takes a point of view. I think the problem is when they become judgmental of, of what followed. History happened when it, when it happened. You can't take modern mores and put it on historical actions. And yet we have. I also think that, that students used to push back against professors and, and what they were teaching and their ideology, and it was accepted that that was good debate, that the kids were to push back and have their own ideas. Um, I'm not so sure that that's the case anymore. I think, you know, today's professor is more likely to admonish or give you a bad grade if you push back. But, but where do you draw that opinion from, Mike? Um, my own kids in, in college, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> who learn very quickly um, just – just go through the class and and don't make waves. So I, I, my oldest son was in a class where the professor was a uh, socialist, and he was teaching that that was the best economic system, a system of socialism is the best way to to uh, set up your country. And uh, it wasn't he wasn't doing it to challenge the students. He was doing it because they were teaching the different systems of the world, and it was his opinion that socialism was the best. And my son pushed back on that. It didn't cost him a grade mm -hmm. or anything. But, but the more alarming thing to me was that in the class... And he was allowed told me, to do that. Well, no, the more alarming thing to me was in the class that most of the students agreed with the professor that socialism is the best way. And and that's the but, larger point there. But, uh, how are these kids getting to high school believing that socialism is the way to go? Well, I think they're all. I, would think I mean, even, getting to I college. Would, even right. I was a socialist when I was young, and then I started getting a paycheck. And once I started getting a paycheck and seeing how <laughs> socialism doesn't always work the way you think it works. It's never worked. You know, it, Did you just yeah. give your opponent something to clip yeah, sure, off the radio? absolutely. Mike I, Kite, I'm, I'm a socialist. I, there was a time when I was a socialist, <laughs> and then I started earning a paycheck and saying, wait a minute, I'm paying for all these programs. And on that note, to prove you're not a socialist, he's going to pick up lunch today for everybody in the room. That's <laughs> yes. a heck of a gesture, Mike Height. That is just glorious. As the uh, horn stylings of one Al Hurtborn this day in uh, 1922.
That would make him 101 where he's still alive. Of course, he's not. Uh, but I've killed off artists before on this show that weren't actually <laughs> dead, so don't take my word for it. As uh, Donald Trump would say in his financial filings, do your own due diligence. That's the best way, to, by the way, to do a financial filing. <laughs> <laughs> Just throw some numbers on there and go, by the way, don't take these seriously. Make sure you investigate these on your own. <laughs> that's the best excuse I've ever heard. <laughs> that's every real estate transaction, right? I mean, you got, it's, it's up to you to survey it when it's, mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's up to hey, the financial it's what, institution to it's figure it out. It's worth what somebody will pay for it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, I want to uh, focus on some state stuff in this segment here with two delegates in the House. And first and foremost, I want to get into a little bit of education discussion here because you were on the Education Committee, sure. uh, Michael Hornby. We had a, a pretty good discussion about uh, that on a previous show here, uh, too, and that is regards to fixing West Virginia's education system, right? So we do know the, the voters uh, rejected an amendment, though not in Berkeley County, that would have given the legislature some oversight of the State Board of Education. With that not being the case, how much influence can a legislature have over a State Board of Education? And does the State Board of Education, in your opinion, have that much influence over the local school districts? Um, I think they do. I think they can affect local school, school districts. I think you, you just look at that discipline bill that, that came out. Uh, very disappointed in the State Board of Education, how they implemented that. They kind of just sent it out to all of the counties. I think the State Board of Education should have implemented a plan and explained exactly what that law does. And I don't think they do a good job of doing passing down the actual rules. Do you think that they didn't pass it down effectively, in your opinion, because they weren't in favor of it? Or no. because they didn't have enough input on it? Or because they just didn't care. It wasn't affecting them, so it doesn't. You know, it, it's a it's a number of, of things. We had a, a really good meeting. Mike was uh, Mike was at at the meeting. I was driving back from Charleston um, with the local board of education, and uh, I thought there was some really good ideas that came out of that meeting, and some really um, there's some going to be some legislation that comes out of that that meeting that I thought was really good that we can implement and help. Why do you think? And I just want to point out, like with the SAT scores. One of the, after that was reported, uh, the next emphasis was on shredding the comparisons, not on addressing the problems in West Virginia. And, and I find that mm -hmm. to be more the case when information comes out about the state's education or previously about the economy, maybe 10 years ago. The approach is to shred the actual report and its validity as opposed to addressing the problem. And they did it once again with the SAT scores. And I think they've been doing that with all the scores. We've seen the scores over the last five years. You could go go, go on that site like I told you, um, and you can see the scores for every grade, and we are not meeting the criteria of what we need to be meeting, and, and there has to be change. But why? Why aren't we meeting? The, the, yes. Uh, well, that's that's the million dollar question, isn't it? So, but what, as far as the SAT, you have to have some kind of measurable um, system. You have to be able to measure yourself against other states in some fashion. Some fashion. So there has to be some kind of, of test. Now, you know, the the Board of Education, the State Board of Education, in West Virginia, may not have agreed with that, but still, there has to be some kind of measurable. Um, way to 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 see how well you're doing and and it did measure us pretty bad we're not doing very well so uh, me personally i would like to see a lot of the 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 curriculum and ways of teaching um pushed down to the local level i would much rather see berkeley county um board of education who i, I think has some good people on it and i think they they're they're trying real hard to do some good things um maybe hampered some by what the mandates from the State Board of Education are. So if you could push those down to them, um, there there may be improvements in Berkeley County. And if not, then it's incumbent upon the people to find other people in, to put in those positions to, to make it happen. Um, right now, there there is no mechanism for oversight by the people or by the legislation of the State Board of Education in West Virginia. And I think fundamentally it comes down to the fact that we are just pushing kids through the grades and there's no consequences for them not learning. So 
whether it be by the parents, whether it be by the teachers, whether it be by the kids themselves. We just push them all the way through and get them out. That's Everybody gets to go to college anyway, right? So it, it's one of those things. There are no consequences for not learning. You're not going to get held back anymore. I mean, no, kid, no child left behind. That was probably the worst thing we've done for education. And yes, we're doing worse than other states. But here in West Virginia, we, ha we, we can address it, and I think we will address it. Uh, we're moving in the right direction, but, you know, it's, it comes down to the, the I think consequences. one of the other problems is, is funding, and maybe Mike can talk a little bit about this, is funding and how funding is tied to the scoring and, and behavior and, and different things like that. So there's this, this move to, to sort of hide things so it doesn't affect your funding. So Yeah, I, I think it's the administration within the buildings – has a financial part in this where if they pass kids or if they score kids, they don't do the discipline side of it, they get better federal funding. Um, when you start disciplining kids or holding kids back, it looks bad on your, your, your scores or things like that. Um, when you look at the scoring, you know, the only thing Berkeley County, and I'm not just picking on Berkeley, but you look at all the, the discipline seems to be the only thing that's great in all our schools. Well, when you talk to the teachers or you talk to the BOE, discipline is the worst part of our scores. Like, the teachers are complaining these kids are not getting any consequences for bad, bad behavior. And I think that was the reason for the legislation is yeah. to, to get these, these kids out of the classroom so that the ones that aren't disruptive can learn. Yeah, a, t a teacher shouldn't be punched in the face one day and then have to teach that kid the next day. Like, that shouldn't happen. Or uh, the next week, or whatever it is. That's your next campaign slogan right there. Well, I mean, <laughs> seriously, right? Like, I, I would push back on the Board of Education and teachers and, and, and things like that, but at the same time, the kids and the parents are also responsible for the behavior that's happening in the schools. And if you walk through the, the, the hallways of a school and you hear, like we were saying, Matt, mm -hmm the foul language, the disrespect for, for, for your elders and things like that, you would be shocked. Let me <clears throat> blindside you with a totally outside-the-box thing to think about. Um, West Virginia has 1.7 million residents in total. Is that right? Fairfax County has 1.2 million residents just in the, in, in the county. Mm -hmm. So there's – West Virginia is, is unique in many ways. And some of it is geographic, some of it is the availability or lack of availability of transportation to get to schools and what have you, and we have the discipline problem. Suppose we eliminate the requirement for kids who don't want to be in high school to be in high school. To, to Instead of, I don't know when the age of self-emancipation is, I think it's probably 16, but if we lower it to 14, in terms of education is concerned, the discipline problems go away because discipline problems come from the kids who don't want to be there. They want to be disruptive. So if we change the focus to to serve the kids who want to learn and then you know, not ignore the kids who don't, but that's that's a different issue. We'll, we'll find other, so, other vo vocational schools or something for right. them to go to. But one of the ways to solve, it seems to me, looking from the outside and having never been a teacher, um, but I do make stuff up for a living. Uh, if if we focus our efforts on those who wish to learn, a lot of our problems go away. I would agree with you. I think we need to focus on the, on the people that want to. And I think that's why. I mean, I'd like to see the Mountaineer Challenge Academy expand it. That's the, one of the best programs we have in West Virginia, where we're sending kids down. They're, 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 I know it's military school, but we could have more of those academies. We could have vocational training. Mm -hmm. I think. At 14 or 15, if you know, a teacher knows at 14 or 15 if this kid is going to go to college or going right. to, they could go to, you know, electrician school, HVAC school, what, whatever it is where they're just mechanic or whatever it is. There needs to be options. I think you're right. I, th I like the idea of the Mountaineer Challenge Academy. Yeah. What that does is that, it's not, you can say military, but what it does is it offers discipline and structure for kids who need discipline and structure and are not getting mm -hmm. that in their community or their home. 
um, and and you see a huge difference in a lot of these kids once they come out of that academy. The success rate is unbelievable, and, yeah. and, and they mm-hmm. are they are. And I, I know kids that we we have people that we know that have come out of that have just absolutely changed because of that structure. I mean, Can there be a private public type of of apprenticeship even you yeah. know not, not only like the training that you might get at a james rumsey but but to be able to actually you know especially if you're 16 you know you, you maybe go to one class or whatever but then you spend the rest of your day with an electrician learning Work, and getting a little bit of money you know it may not be what yeah. uh, you know an, an adult jumping into that may be but you're, you're learning on the job getting a trade getting a skill that you know you don't want to be in a classroom anyway so you're out of the classroom you're not disruptive you're learning something that's going to provide for you and your family i think all those options on the table it's just you you got to take little bites, right? You got to right. get people used to it. You got to get 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 to the the core of the problem. I think if we can get teachers back in the classroom, I think that would be huge because I think well, can they? You mentioned back in the classroom. Is there too much on a teacher? I mean, it seems like yes. there's constant yes. paperwork. Yes. Fill something out. Do this. Can, can you just and I think let them teach? Again, yeah. Again, uh, you're you're chasing funding. That's yeah. the reason for all that paperwork and nonsense. Right. Is you're chasing funding. So, and I think we're going to address some of the training. We're going to try and try and limit some of that. Bring it down a little bit. I think Craig Blair had a great idea on uh, on the BOE conference call that we had. Where the use it or lose it, where they're, they they if they don't use their sick time, they lose it. Uh, they can't cash that out. I think if you told me you get two weeks of sick leave a year, but if you don't use it, then you don't get any more. Um, well, I'm going to take two weeks off then. Mm-hmm. Sure. So if you told me I can take two weeks of pay at the end of the year because I showed up to work and I wasn't sick, mm-hmm. wouldn't you go? Wouldn't you think, hey, you know what? I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay. Or, well, and or by the way, teachers. it was posted on our Facebook comment section not too long ago when this conversation came up that the reason why there's more teacher absences from those teachers who are actually mm-hmm. employed full-time is because of the change in the way that we address sick days. And I think we, we tried to change it so that, oh, you know, we don't want people banking sick time or vacation time. I think we've, we did wrong. With, I agree. That, yeah. I think we need to go back and, and give these teachers the opportunity to go, hey, you know what? I've got six weeks of vacation. I'm not going to take it. I'm going to bank that so that when I retire or when I want to when I want to take a vacation, I can really go on a vacation or I can go in the summer. It had it had unintended consequences, yeah. mm-hmm. and and there used to be they could bank that that time towards their retirement, so they could retire early, and and that time would count towards their retirement. And I think when the legislature changed that, it had this unintended consequence when when you can bank that time and now there's an incentive to show up for work every single day um because you can you can retire earlier um i I think that had a a huge effect and i think the way the pay structure is set up with the step increases it almost encourages you to retire earlier because i think the steps stop at a certain point then you're locked out and then if you don't get the regular raise that they give Mm -hmm. and the raise they give at the higher end is Mm -hmm. much less than the raise you get at the lower end because the emphasis was made by the governor to increase starting salaries so we could we could recruit uh, more teachers to the area that's correct. So yeah, if you're right. making if you're making the top end of the pay scale, your raise is very small. It's not it's not the five percent raise that that's that uh, that gets advertised. Correct. It's yeah, an average. by design. And by the way, that which brings me to PEIA because I saw the story yesterday. That there'll be another ten percent increase in PEIA premiums. Uh, health insurance premiums are going up for everybody, and now the state has made a commitment to meet the eighty twenty ratio that uh, had been ignored for so long. But after a 24% increase in PEIA last year, there's another 10% this year. Last year, you folks th- threw out a, a one-time stipend. Will you be doing something similar this year? <laughs> I, I, I don't know what leadership has planned for that, but I will tell you this. We cannot keep making changes for one-third of uh, our workforce when two-thirds of our workforce, as Mike Hyde has, has said publicly, um, everybody's insurance is going up. The since the Affordable Care Act passed, all insurance has gone up for everybody. Become and less affordable. <laughs> yeah, it's become ironically. Yeah. And, and Speaking of unintended we, consequences. We yeah. need to address the problem, and that's the insurance rate or the actual rate of health care. So mm-hmm. it, it's 
it's one of those things where the the, the government funded loans for um, you know going to college. Well, all the rates went up. Now the government's forcing everybody to take health care. Well, all the rates went up. It, it seems like we keep making this mistake over and over and over again. But you can't. That's a national problem. You can't fight effectively at the state level on your no, own. No, but I can't hold back and hold funds for state employees all the time. Rates are going to go up. PEIA is going to go up. Insurance rates are going to go up. It's part of life. I agree, but mm -hmm. you're going to lose even more teachers in a state where you've already got a crisis situation with a shortage of teachers. You know, it's one of those things that we have a shortage across the United States. Um, I would love to give every teacher $100,000, but the unfortunate part you is tried to give can't. teachers a pretty good raise last <laughs> we, session. And, and we will do that again. Is it is it going to pass? Probably not because it's going to raise the thing. But out of our education committee, we have a responsibility to try. Um, and then it goes to the fiscal hawks, and it's up to them to decide if we can actually make <laughs> it happen. Your, your buddy here is and, on the finance committee. And side. I know that's harsh, but that's, that's the responsibility of our committee. We're not trying to spend every cent, but then finance can take a look at it and say, hey, listen, this is what we can afford because they're the ones that have, have the oversight of money. The Education Committee has never seen a dollar. They didn't like to spend. <laughs> I, I can tell you that. Yeah. That's their job, right? Yes. Spend yes, on education, is. you have to. Uh, hey, so, uh, Mike, in regards to the uh, your work on the Finance Committee and such, clearly in the state there was a uh, an agreement that the, we, for teachers we can't and state employees, we can't pay you a lot, we can't even promise you annual increases, uh, but we will keep your health insurance premiums affordable mm -hmm. and with a 24% increase last year and another 10% this year, who knows what's next? That little handshake agreement seems to be stretched now. Well, that, that philosophy that, that happened in the past, that philosophy has come back to, to haunt us. Um, we, we probably shouldn't have done that in the past because what's happened now is, is we didn't raise um, premiums for quite some time. Um, and now it is coming back to bite us because PEIA was on the verge of bankruptcy.